Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Darcy Clark, as Peter said. Um, I've come a long way to uh, be with you guys here today. Um, and I think this should work. Uh, quickly, if this is on. There we go. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to Peter, Vanessa, and Yelp. Um, can we give them another round of applause, guys? They're So this is one of the largest HTML5 groups, or the largest HTML5 group in the world. So um, it's pretty awesome that they're able to uh, bring you guys all here. Um, and there was 500 people or over that um, registered. So um, I'd like to meet all of you at some point. Uh, there's time after uh, the talk um, if you would like to shake my hand um, or say hi. Um, so I actually saw uh, this survey Peter gave me uh, a little insight into what you guys like. Um, and I made another bit.ly URL that's a little bit easier to get to, I think. Uh, and definitely check out this data. I thought it was really cool. Um, essentially, again, um, it's sort of like a census of what you guys like and what's sort of going to be trending in the next few months. Um, surprisingly, there was no like design topics there. So hopefully, everybody here cares about that stuff. Because um, we're going to talk a little bit about that and obviously uh, documentation. So I'm at Darcy, sweet, right, on Twitter. Yeah, my first name. Um, if anybody likes Jane Austen, you can refer to me as Mr. Darcy. Um, <laughs> that's OK. Uh, my best friends do. Yeah? Scott, are you um, Darcy Tucker and Wendell Clark's son? Oh, yeah. Dude, I get that all the time. <laughs> and the fact that you like hockey, even better. We're hanging out. Um, but no, I'm not. I'm not Darcy uh, Tucker or Wendell Clark's son. Um, I wish I was Clark Kent and Mr. Darcy. Um, so my names were uh, switched around. But um, yeah, so I'm at Darcy. That's great. Uh, hashtag our username tab. Um, unfortunately, I get a lot of missed tweets. So stuff like this. People are like asking my mom for feedback, <laughs> creep in my house when I'm not there. And this is my favorite. Apparently, I'm teaching kids to like techno. <laughs> <laughs> this is not me. OK, so just, just watch out for that. Um, uh, so some of the work that you may know me by, um, if you're in the WordPress community, I started a company three years ago uh, called Themify. Um, it's a commercial WordPress theme company. Um, it's still being run by my business partner, Nick Law. Um, as well, I've worked with a bunch of uh, awesome agencies in the US and in Canada. Um, FI is probably the biggest that's on there. Um, and through those companies and also doing contract work, I've gotten to work with some awesome brands like Google, uh, Microsoft, Nike, Samsung. Um, I've also done a lot of open source work. Uh, I helped the jQuery team a few years back when they were trying to get the website redesigned. Um, did a lot of work with them. Did a lot of uh, uh, plugins, which you can go check out um, on my GitHub page. Um, and also, if you guys, how many people know about the front end developer interview questions? Raise your hand. What? How many people are front end developers in this room? What? Who, who are the rest of you? Uh, I'm just kidding. How many designers are in the room? OK, OK. I'm starting to figure it out. Um, but that's a great resource. It's being translated to over 25 different languages. Um, which is amazing. There's uh, about 150 questions there. You can completely ignore it. I've got a lot of flack on Reddit for like being like, this is what you're supposed to ask people. Um, but yeah, I've done a lot of, uh, a lot of open source work. Um, and uh, the project that you're actually going to hear about today is uh, DSS. And that's going to be uh, probably something that I'm going to work into, into the near. Um, it's going to be my baby. Um, I'm Canadian. <laughs> this is what Canadians look like. There was a guy from North Bay. Is he here? Is that you? No, no, I'm OK. Well, he was like registered. And I'm from like a little town that's close by called Sudbury. Um, so as a true Canadian, I have to apologize for a couple things. <laughs> no, I have a cold. I, I really actually have a cold. I'm uh, super stuffed up. So if we're talking later, and I can't hear you, and I have to ask you um, uh, to repeat your question, uh, I apologize. I'm actually super stuffed up, super like not here, but here. Um, but that rhymes with gold. Yeah? No? Anybody? Hockey? OK, OK. But I saw this. And that's right, you're keeping them, right? 
<laughs> Just saying, okay. See, they changed the sign after we won the hockey game. Um, but we gave you, we gave Bieber, let's just put it out there, warranty included like this, and you guys. <laughs> that said, if you want to give us back Ryan Gosling, we will take him. He's cool. Um, so what I do essentially is I'm a developer, a front-end developer, and yeah, not exactly like that. But uh, yeah, I'm a front-end developer by trade. I went to college for uh, programming. Um, so I'm in HTML, CSS, JavaScript all day. I'm also a designer, right, like Bob Ross. And uh, I actually, as well, almost by trade, um, I went to a performing arts high school, majored in visual art, got all my art history, color theory out of the way really young, and also started programming really young. Um, so if you guys are 80s child, children, 90s children, you may remember fame. It is a lot like fame. My teenage years were awesome. Um, people running through the hallways. And I'm a little bit of a businessman as well. So uh, still have, I've created two companies, uh, still do contract work. Um, so I sort of understand the whole, the whole picture when it comes to building pro projects and, and working with clients and, uh, and building products. So I like to take a holistic approach to problem solving. Um, essentially what that means is I'm able to understand the goals. Having all, all that experience, I'm able to better understand um, the goals or objectives of a project from every standpoint. The goals or objectives from a design standpoint, development, um, and business. Um, and it also means I'm able to better communicate with people um, uh, within all those facets of you know, a project life cycle. And I also feel shared responsibility because of all this um, in the end result in each one of those, uh, each one of those points in the project life cycle. So I think this is really important. A lot of people would say, I'm sort of a jack of all trades. I would say, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. I would say jack of all trades, like really good at a lot of them. Um, but yeah, so past 12 months I've worked on a lot of things. Uh, if you are interested in any of these, please come in and talk to me afterwards. Um, but the key one here is documentation. Uh, last 12 months I really focused on that um, with a number of different companies um, and how to uh, obviously get their teams communicating better and to document uh, their libraries, their frameworks, um, or their websites. Um, and also in here is JavaScript video decoders. If anybody knows anything about that, please talk to me afterwards because it's like crazy awesome. Um, the stuff that you can do now with uh, video. Um, so designing and documenting uh, user interfaces was actually a talk uh, that I took around to Prague, London, and Toronto last year. And it was a lot of fun, um, but it was a little shallow. Um, this is sort of, this talk is based on this. Um, but I, after I went and, uh, and traveled sort of uh, halfway around the world, um, I got some perspective when I came back by reading two specific books, again, um, that sort of changed uh, the direction of this talk. Um, so how many people have read Don't Make Me Think? A lot of people. If you haven't, go buy it. The revisited version is amazing. So uh, Steve Krug originally came out with this book in, uh, I think, 2002. It's absolutely amazing. I reread it. I realized, along with this book, and this one, how many people have read About Face? Three? A few people? This is also another one. I consider these two books to be like the holy grail of interaction, user experience design, and just understanding how to um, uh, create an experience. And, th and that was the key. I, I read these two books again, and I realized that I wasn't focusing enough on experiences. Um, so that's why I changed essentially the title to you know, Designing and Documenting User Interactions. Um, experiences is pretty broad. Everybody throws UX around um, and it encompasses everything. Um, <coughs> so interactions is a little bit nicer um, and uh, it's a little bit more specific as well. So let's, let's dive into this. I want to sort of look at uh, the typical workflows that you probably are dealing with uh, in your company, within your teams. 
Uh, and I want to sort of vet a few things about them and then uh, look at some problems and how we're going to solve them. So a stereotypical workflow um, of a project is going to be something like uh, IA or a strategy phase that, that bleeds into some sort of design and development phase. Um, this is a little bit different sometimes. Um, it doesn't necessarily happen, have to happen in this order or in order. Um, obviously, if you're working within uh, agile development uh, or if you're working you know, in waterfall uh, development, uh, then this is maybe a little bit different how you uh, do this or maybe you do this more often. Um, so there's some stereotypical stakeholders in this, in this equation. One of them is your, uh, he's, he's got sultry eyes right now, your hipster designer, right? He's got, he's got his Instagram photo, which, you know, the pantones aren't showing up. And then your developer, right? With the sweet beard. No? That's totally me in, like, never. Um, but yeah, these are typically, you got designer, developer working on the team. Sometimes you have, you have project managers, but we're really talking about uh, the design process here. And they, uh, the responsibilities usually break down to a designer or many designers will take over the strategy. Um, and this includes uh, things like wireframes, um, an IA document that also includes sitemaps potentially. Um, and you might have many designers, you might have many developers, but this is sort of how the responsibilities are played out. So the designer takes over the IA and design and development takes over the development phase, um, whether or not that includes prototyping as well. So, there's a few problems with this, um, and it's the problem, uh, our, our problems arise uh, in these gaps. So the gaps are essentially uh, deliverables or uh, actually gaps for communication. So between here, there's a chance for something to be passed off or communicated uh, to somebody different, or there's something to be created or deliverable at these times. And this is where problems start to arise within documentation and within communication uh, within your team. So what can start to happen is it feels like a vacuum effect. And these two people are like hanging out together and nobody else can listen into the conversation. If you are uh, working with a big team, if you have a number of projects going on, what happens is there's really no communication outside of that team and they're uh, essentially siloed and you're not sharing, uh, knowledge sharing amongst your teams uh, because of the way that you're communicating and the deliverables are essentially uh, become stagnant and uh, you're static. So communication is broken. So what are the stereotypical deliverables from this process? Um, it comes from, there's a, a bunch of things but there's Things like sketches, uh, paper prototypes, wireframes, uh, sitemaps, IA documents, Photoshop files, and, well, the final website. So if you've got budget or time, there's a couple other things that you could do, like mood boards, um, style tiles, which are essentially kind of like mood boards, and uh, functional prototypes. You could actually uh, get the developer to do a couple uh, rounds of like creating uh, prototypes are mocking out uh, interaction. Um, and going even further, there's been a couple uh, really good examples of what could be next um, to help communicate better, um, essentially your UI, your UX, and uh, essentially how a user is gonna interact with um, a website or web app. So a company that I used to work for, Fancy Interactive, FI, uh, does anybody know who they are? One guy, two guys, awesome. Uh, so we used to create, and the internal team created a few times, um, essentially like UI libraries, PSDs, um, and at one point even uh, HTML, CSS, and JS version of uh, UI components that could be reused within our projects and could be uh, shared with other designers or developers and then built upon. And you could have multiple versions of these, of these uh, files. And that was really great because it essentially um, helped us standardize the way the look and feel is going to happen, uh, how everything interacts with each other, and, and it really it was essential to us uh, launching a project that didn't have a ton of inconsistencies. Um, TN and Lax is actually a local Toronto uh, agency 
and they are pretty well known for the fact that they create like this UI library every time there's a new iOS update and uh, it's really thorough, extremely thorough and it's another great example of creating a document that essentially has all your views, all your components living uh, in it and it's a great uh, resource and a great UI library to be shared within your team. And then there's this trend, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen it, a lot of people that are on Dribbble will have hopefully seen it, of actually animating their designs and showing interaction. And you'll see a lot of anime GIFs that now actually are, are literally uh, showing you what they want to happen when, uh, when somebody hovers, clicks. Um, and this is really beautiful, um, except there's uh, some problems with all of these. Every one of these, every one of these examples I just showed you, every one of these deliverables. The problem is that they are essentially decentralized. There is a, you know, a mock-up or a PSD sitting somewhere. You have no clue where it is. If you've got a Dropbox account, it's off in the ether. And they don't reflect reality. In every single one of those contexts, you're viewing this uh, asset essentially within uh, not the actual context of a browser or a web or an app. Um, and they are also all static. So they require manually being updated and versioning and all these things. So th this is, there's, these are three big problems with all of those deliverables. So we need living documents and we need living documentation in order for us to solve these problems. So uh, good documentation is going to be obviously very concise. This is descriptive. This is very common, standardized, easy to implement and maintain. I'm n I can't stand here in front of all of you and tell you something and, and then you go back to your teams and if, if it adds too much overhead, it's not going to work. It's not going to be implemented. So there needs to be a solution that's easy for you to integrate into your workflow. So, and essentially, it needs to add value at the very, at the very end of the day. Um, documentation, doing this, documenting your uh, interfaces, your interactions, uh, and what you want your user to essentially see and feel um, needs to add value. So, bad documentation, obviously, it's going to be aloof, confusing, wrong, you're hard to maintain, like I said. And, but essentially, what happens when you have bad documentation is that you lose trust. I remember uh, about five years ago uh, creating Facebook uh, pages with uh, FBXML or FBXHTML or whatever it was. And uh, I remember looking at the documentation, expecting that it was going to be up to date and correct. And uh, when it was said that it was supposed to give back some sort of truthy value instead of a falsy value, it was completely wrong. The API was completely off. Um, and that I lost trust in developing on that platform. So you cannot, cannot create bad documentation and you have to have up-to-date documentation. Or essentially it's like this, right? Sweet, good luck, man. Have fun. I, I would never want to go wherever that is. And I have no clue where I would go even if I did know which street was which. Like, what's that? Is that just like a right into? Like, is that, it doesn't even connect. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, oh, <laughs> you on a trip, man? Uh, did you just try going here? Uh, did it just say GPS lost? Oh, uh, that's good timing. Um, so, uh, yeah, why wouldn't I document? Uh, well, essentially, if your project lifecycle, if you guys all work on two-day projects, is it going to add uh, value? No, it's going to add overhead if you actually go out and try to implement something that um, is, more, uh, is better used in long-term projects. Also, the team and reach. If you are a team of one, if you're a freelance developer, a lot of times it's not going to help you. Um, sometimes, but not all the time, it's not going to help you to really document each project that you do um, for later on. Now, there might be reusable components, of you know, work that you're doing that is good, but I, I bet it's not gonna actually add that much value for you. And of course, if the time and cost isn't there, um, and that essentially goes back to the first two, um, whether it's timely and it's uh, costly. 
So challenges with interactive documentation. Well, the challenges we're going to face is essentially context. So whether you're in mobile context, browser context, app context, how do we fix that uh, as well? There's a whole bunch of slew of issues with inheritance. Um, also, you have to uh, essentially uh, interactive documentation requires visual aids. It's not like reference APIs for, uh, let's say, Backbone or any of the JavaScript libraries or programming libraries you've probably seen. They don't really need to give you uh, an actual functioning version of, of the code. Now, if you've seen something like CoffeeScript, where you are, I think even uh, Ruby at one point, or Ruby on Rails, you could actually run code in the browser. That, that was pretty cool. That was like a visual aid of the actual functionality of a snippet of code. Um, this is a requirement in this case for interactive documentation. Multiple languages. The problem is this also spans more than just JavaScript more than just uh, uh, Ruby, more than just uh, PHP. This spans HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So uh, when we're talking about front-end development. So there's a couple of examples of great interactive documentation, and I'm going to actually show you how to do this. Um, so Bootstrap, uh, everybody knows, knows it. Everybody loves it or hates it. And uh, whether you like it or not, they've got some of the best interactive documentation I've ever seen. And we're some of the first to actually do it. And it, it's beautiful. You can essentially see a UI component, see how it's going to be uh, used, interacted with, in the context in which it's going to live, which is the browser. Whether you're using Firefox, whether you're using uh, Chrome, Opera, or using Safari. list goes on, or IE. Uh, or IE. Right. Who's using IE here, right? Yeah? <laughs> no. Come on. I mean, is there a Microsoft guy here? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if there is. I don't want to call you out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Bootstrap was one of the first. Foundation is also very similar. They, they essentially are showing you uh, how something's going to look when implemented, along with the implementation details right there. Uh, and it's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, BBC is also has a great example of their own. Now, I'm not sure what they're using or whether it's like the other two, um, but it's another, again, great uh, utilization or great implementation of, you know, this uh, communicating their, to their team or to their uh, developers, you know, this is how we're going to implement X uh, feature, component, or interactive uh, detail. So, there are still some more problems, actually, with these three apparently amazing examples. They're all static. If you go to Bootstrap, like, uh, th there's some, but if you go to like Bootstrap's uh, GitHub, essentially all these uh, documents are built statically, right? They are manually updated in like markdown files or HTML files. And the examples have to be updated, again, in sort of separate um, uh, markdown or HTML files. And th this is a problem, right? because we still want living, interactive uh, documentation. So, I know that the guys here are going to love this, right? I, I saw it. I saw it come out. I'm not sure if anybody else did. But Yelp actually has uh, living, let's, let's see if I can get this in focus. I'm going to have to like, oh, that's what I get for using like background size cover. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's like, sweet, oh, 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 okay, sweet. So this is actually uh, their web page, um, not their web page, but this is what the design is, um, of their living style guide. Essentially, this is being uh, created from their CSS code um, and using comment blocks. Um, Starbucks, actually, I was very surprised. I'm not sure if there's any Starbucks developers here, but they also have something similar in which they have uh, sort of a living style guide that produces something similar to Foundation or similar to Bootstrap in that you see actor, actual components right alongside the implementation. And of course, GitHub uh, was the first one to actually do this. Let me go full screen again. Ooh, ooh. 
There we go. Some crazy scroll bars going on here too. Um, GitHub was actually probably one of the first to do this because of Kyle Neath. And they also have something very similar to the other two examples where you can actually see all these components, how they are implemented, and how they actually look and feel and interact. So how are they doing this? How are they getting this done? Well, they're doing essentially stack file analysis. And if you want to get down to layman's terms, it's comment block parsing. Um, so if you've ever seen uh, comment blocks in a, like JavaScript or you know, there's style guides to how you should be writing and documenting your code, uh, your functional code, um, it'll look something like this, right? So you have like the name of whatever your function or method is going to be uh, or your class and then you have uh, you know, the fact that it's constructor. Down here you, know, you have um, an example of the fact that you're listing all the parameters that your method's going to take, um, as well as saying uh, you know, what is going to be returned. So this all goes right in line into your code, essentially. And this is great, because this makes sure that you can maintain this documentation as you're developing. Now, the key here for us as front-end developers, we already have tools for uh, JavaScript stack file analysis, comment block, uh, parsing, key here for us is going to be to focus on CSS. Sort of the Wild West, and we're going to tame the Wild West um, by adding more structure to it. So why CSS? It has context. It has uh, pseudo classes and states, which uh, essentially let us uh, know what the, um, the state is of that component. Uh, it's inherently visual. So it's going to meet that you know, visual aid um, requirement. Um, and it bridges the languages. Right? CSS is like the glue between uh, you know, HTML and JavaScript, kind of. You know, it's the, the thing that makes everything look pretty and gives it um, a style, essentially. So there are tools out there to do this right now. And these are essentially what I want you guys to take away with you uh, at the end of the day and actually start implementing and working with your teams to help create uh, better workflows and better communication and better documentation at the end of the day. So KSS uh, is actually um, a project by Kyle Neath of uh, GitHub. I'm not sure if there's anybody from GitHub here, but he's awesome. He started this project uh, about a year and a half ago, I think. Um, he named it kind of after himself, like KSS. Um, yeah, there you go, Knile Style Sheets. Um, so essentially, uh, this is a Ruby gem. Um, it was kind of just like a, a quick little project I think he put together without much thought to it. Um, although, you know, he was trying to solve a problem. And this is actually what they're using at GitHub. They do a lot of Ruby development there. Um, and they're actually using this uh, to generate their, uh, their documentation. And actually, uh, Yelp is using the Python, a Python port of uh, KSS right now to generate theirs. I'm sure anybody from Yelp will be able to tell you more about their actual implementation and experience with this um, after the talk. So this is what a uh, KSS style guide comment block is going to look like. So this is what you would actually implement into your CSS, into your component, into your preprocessor of choice. Um, and it's very similar to the way that you would do um, uh, any sort of uh, programming uh, documentation uh, in line. You say essentially what the component is, um, you list all the states, and then uh, for KSS specifically, you have to sort of say, um, you know, uh, where does this sort of component live and how can I access it? So it says at the bottom here, style guide uh, 213. And that just gives it essentially a numerical value uh, that will get parsed out and uh, sort of organize your, your, uh, your components. So this is example again of, of what gets generated. This is pretty much the GitHub documentation or the GitHub style guide, which all their designers and developers use. It's a centralized resource for them to know uh, essentially how to get work done. So you can again go to warpspire.com, KSS, and, and check out some more uh, examples. So KSS has a couple ports in case you're not a big fan of gem in installs, no? Ruby gems. Uh, there's again a grunt 
of course, grunt uh, task, uh, grunt KSS. There is a gulp if you're like super into the new and awesome. It's the gump, pull, uh, gump gulp port. Uh, and Python KSS, like I said before, is what, uh, or Pi KSS is what Yelp is using. So the pros of actually using this is that it actually uh, dynamically generates like a, a JSON object. And it enforces structured commenting so that you're gonna get less of sort of cruft, I feel, in your CSS. There's gonna be a lot less people rewriting display block like a million times in your CSS if it's inheriting from something else. Believe me, it's not gonna happen. Position relative is gonna only happen like three times. I'm telling you, if you did analysis on your uh, current code base, you would realize that there's a ton of uh, redundancies that get reduced. Uh, so it encourages documentation of states, it reduces redundancy not only in your code, but obviously within your documentation. You don't have to uh, update a component and then go to some other wiki and update the documentation there. And it works with SAS, LESS, and SCSS, of course. Awesome. The cons, because it's never okay. There's never like a 100% solution, right? There, it's very strict. So the comment block that I showed you before, essentially that's how you have to implement it. Um, so it, it's kind of strict in the way that you have to format um, your documentation. And static sections, this means that you actually have to write in, you know, style guide 1.12. One, one, That's going to have to be manually updated uh, every time, you know, you uh, want to put something or reorganize uh, something. So, and it doesn't really address context very well uh, as far as like a mobile or some sort of responsive component. And it doesn't address inheritance issues that you're going to get when something extends, like one component extends from another base um, class, right? So I created a project, right? Yeah? No? TSS, right? It's not named after me. I'm humble. I'm Canadian. It's documented style sheets. Just so happens with D, right? You know, Darcy, document, it's fine. No, but uh, so I started a, uh, a project, essentially it was originally a port of, uh, of KSS, um, but I wanted to take it one step further. I wanted to actually so solve some of the problems that I was seeing within interaction uh, design and within interaction documentation. So what is it? Well, it's essentially a documentation tool, just like KSS. It's a style guide, just like KSS has, you know, format your comments in this style. And it's a comment parser, right? So it's going to be able to parse everything out for you. Um, great. So the pros of DSS, same thing, dynamically generates an object, encourages structured commenting. Now, the difference here is that it encourages. It doesn't enforce, right? Provides API for custom detectors, parsers, templates. So this is awesome, and I'll show you why in a second. But it essentially will allow your team to come up with your own conventions um, that are useful for you and add value where you need it. And encourages documentation of states. Reduces redundancy, just like KSS. Works with any file. Any file. So this is actually not, I shouldn't even call it documented style sheets. It should be documented any file. DAF. DAF, not cool, um, but you know, works with any file. So we're talking stylus, SCSS, S, uh, SAS, less. You could really be commenting or comment, parse, comment block parsing uh, JavaScript files at the same time with the same tool. Um, and it separated the concerns. So in KSS's um, uh, implementation, the comment parser and the actual documentation generator are all in one library. Uh, we've separated the two. So you'll see if you go to npm, uh, js.org, package, DSS, the parser's there. You can do whatever you want with it, um, like create a gulp abstraction. Again, we don't have a gulp uh, uh, package yet. Um, we just have a grunt task. Um, and the grunt task here essentially consumes the parser and uh, then generates the documentation for you. So when you're including this into your project, all you do is include uh, you know, the grunt DSS as a task 
and you'll automatically generate your documentation uh, you know, every time you build a new set of code. So this is what DSS style guide looks like. It's very similar um, to actually the more programmatic um, implementation of, of comment blocks. So you'll see that where I'm actually using parameters in every case. And this is where you're going to get the flexibility because you can essentially create any uh, variable name that you want and we will parse it out and you will have that value there. So you can basically come up with your own uh, terminology within your team and your own uh, requirements for your team to uh, essentially add value to your documentation. Um, so if there requires an image or a visual aid or a video or a reference link, um, you can add that in here um, at, at your need through, for whatever you need. Um, so there are only four defaults that the actual parser comes and comes looking for, and those are the name, description, state, and markup. Um, and those are the defaults that are in KSS, um, so we just decide to have the exact same uh, defaults. So this will automatically uh, get pulled out of your uh, CSS comment blocks and be provided for you to use um, in a template, which is right now just handlebars. But you can use mustache, whatever you want. So this is what a state parser, the state parser actually looks like. Internally, it, we are actually using our, the exact same API that is exposed to you guys and what you can create um, on your own for your own team. So here, essentially, we're just getting um, an index, a line, block, file. My formatting is terrible. Don't look at that. But, uh, but yeah, essentially, and then we return uh, an object uh, for us to use later on um, in uh, our template. So that was the default. That's native built in, native. Um, but this is like, this is an example of what you could do uh, for your team. So here is a, a link that I think, uh, you know, to issues. Uh, I'm going to use it somewhere in my template, or it's going to be potentially an image. Uh, whatever it is, I, all I have to do is go at link. It's a brand new uh, variable name. Wasn't a requirement before, but now let's say my team always wants to have reference to a specific issue, image, whatever it is. We add that in, and then I just create my own custom parser, right, called link, and I get the same things passed to that callback, um, and then I can do whatever I want with essentially the string um, that the the line that's uh, being passed to, to this parser. And I can return whatever I want um, to be used, again, later on in template. So essentially what gets built once we parse out your comment blocks is just a JSON object. So what we do with that is pass it to a handlebars template, and that generates some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So this is what it looks like. You can see name uh, is button, description, your standard form button, and then there's a whole bunch of states in there um, that also have a bunch of um, associated uh, data to them. So this is what it looks like. It looks almost the exact same to you know, KSS or the other, uh, the other sort of ports. Um, but there's a future here. Um, there, let me, let me refresh this hide it for a second. There is a future to this project. Um, I'm not sure if KSS is dead in the water. They're still making ports of it, but it's not really being picked up. I have um, a deeply nested, invested uh, interest in making this work and, and getting everybody to use this uh, project uh, because I think it's important. And so in the next six months, you're probably going to see uh, something come out um, that is a Chrome extension. And essentially what that is going to do is be able to record events. Um, so you would basically hit a, like a play button on an extension. And it's going to record almost like a session. If you've ever done Selenium uh, testing or anything like that, you'll know that you can you know, then replay back a set of events uh, on a component or on uh, uh, essentially a uh, UI piece or HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And uh, what I want to do is get to the point where you're looking at a video of real HTML, CSS, and uh, JavaScript actually uh, in front of you 
you're looking, uh, you can press the play button uh, and watch an interactive um, uh, experience happen in front of you that was documented in the way that the developer or designer had uh, foreseen it and wanted it to be implemented. So you could then uh, have a whole bunch of these sort of uh, experiences uh, in your documentation to show how things should be used. Um, and in the future, we, I also want to sandbox the components. Right now, they all live in the same DOM. They should really be living in little iframe, uh, uh, little iframe sandboxed uh, contexts so that we can actually showcase things like you know, responsive um, or different sort of mobile contexts uh, to give you a better sense of you know, the way that something's actually supposed to look and feel in something other than the current browser and current width and screen width of, uh, of your device. So, some things to keep in mind. The holistic problem that I was talking about at the, or problem solving that I was talking about at the beginning. If more people, I feel, look at problems uh, from a business standpoint, design standpoint, development standpoint, it's easier to communicate, and that's the way I look at it, and you know, I feel that uh, that's adding value. Um, focus on experience, right? Uh, and centralize your documentation and resources. Doing that uh, will be easier for you to actually maintain them. Implement documentation tools like DSS, KSS, or their ports. Uh, make sure that they're actually dynamic, easy to maintain, help communication, increase consistency, and add value. Thanks. Ugh. So I've already knows, but uh, I will take uh, any questions. I'm not sure how we're doing for time here. Uh, pretty good. Um, I will take any questions. You, sir. Right, so you're saying uh, if you're uh, sort of generating or creating your code in such a way and you're sort of enforcing good practices within your team already that... I mean, what's the, what's the difference between, between doing this at the, just at the documentation level versus just making everybody start from the beginning being on the same page? Um, I think that this can be, be done slowly over time. Um, you don't need to like start this like from day one. It's not like um, sort of like, you know, you can uh, start adding documentation as you're building out new components. Um, I'm not quite sure like, uh, I think uh, the problem is that you aren't, if you have a huge team, not even a huge team, but if you have a team of developers and potentially you're creating, again, a UI, UI library, are working on a product or a project that's fairly large, and it's gonna reuse a lot of the same styles. It's, it's necessary for you to have a resource that is centralized that essentially shows you how to implement a button and uh, so that you aren't finding a redundancy or, or duplication within code. And it's very hard for you to, um, once your code gets big enough, it's very hard for you to know what's in there without having to go then dig into um, or have an IDE that lets you know every class that um, is available to you. I still, uh, uh, I'll follow up. yeah, yeah, I, I'd love to hear more about what you're thinking there. Sure. Um, like North Face or, you know, like a Ruby gem. Um, uh, I think style doc is uh, kind of limited, right? Say what? But most of them are just doing like markdown parsing. They're not really enforcing that much of it. Like I feel KSS and we do to some extent, although I'm very like also um, encouraging the idea for you to come up with your own paradigms for your own teams. Uh, I feel like I think style doco is very more free form, right? So just essentially markdown that it does all the examples. Yeah, but it shows you on the side. Like, do you find it's not a problem? Uh, so most preprocessors -pro actually take out uh, comments. Uh, so this wouldn't be a problem so long as you actually do the grunt task, run the grunt task before you would run your, um, uh, let's say, your SAS or your CSS or your stylus uh, compilation. So that wouldn't be a problem. 
um, as far as minification and the way adding bloat. Um, and, it, and really, you've seen this for a long time um, in the programming world. So I don't think it's adding that much overhead. Um, I think it's just you know uh, whipping uh, the sort of front end designer, you know, uh, front end HTML CSS guy into shape a little more and, and providing more structure to to the work that they're doing um, for the greater good of you know your team. Um, but yeah, it, it won't add any overhead as far as bytes or spaces um, if you're uh, still using. Um, uh, some sort of preprocessor or build tool that w that will get actually stripped up. Hi, I'm curious if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you foresee this being used in JavaScript files. Um, so, uh, does anybody know what React is, right? Or Angular, right? You guys all know. Uh, so that that was part of the, I saw um, in that survey. If you guys go check that out really cool data um, that Angular was really high on the um, things that people want to learn more about. Um, what you're starting to see is a lot more uh, components being all centralized, um, all uh, the HTML, the JavaScript, um, sort of be centralized into sort of like these view um, or like these sort of render methods. So like React, for instance, allows you to uh, create like a view or a component um, just inside uh, like a return statement, essentially. And it, it actually generates like an object. Um, but I see uh, essentially you adding documentation at that level about um, uh, the UI component. Um, so that, that's, it's sort of like a win because we, uh, you're doing stack uh, file analysis, um, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're just essentially uh, doing like regex on uh, a string, so you really, you could uh, you do it, um, you could have this kind of uh, parser uh, essentially uh, look over a JavaScript file, a PHP file, or whatever you want, um, but I just, I see it kind of um, incentivized by um, being, running it over JavaScript files when uh, you have sort of a, um, a component that's actually Instead of the view living in a separate handlebars or mustache file, it's actually living in your JavaScript. I see that adding value, uh, commenting um, about it at that point. Is that? Sure. Uh, so, like, we don't, we basically, if you didn't, um, using parameters, like the at variable, essentially doesn't enforce uh, any sort of style or paradigm, whereas the way that they, uh, KSS sort of approached it was much like, um, I think some other programming uh, uh, comment block parsers and style guides, um, that you would have the first line be the name. So you wouldn't have to do at name, um, and that convention sort of, um, to me, felt very strict because the first line um, should be whatever you want it to be. So that's what I mean by strict. And I, I don't, I feel like we've sort of addressed that, like in the, in the that the way that you can uh, basically create any uh, value is just by setting like a variable. It's very flexible in the fact that you uh, can have any variable there. It's, does that count? I am like, I yeah, have yeah. KSS, so. Oh, you have? Yeah, or no? Right. So essentially KSS, right, the first line is actually the name. So that's like strict. The first, uh, the line in the comment block is going to be the name. Um, and then uh, I think the last line is going to be the style guide, um, uh, like number, right? Right. Um, so I would look at the guy that you're handing the mic to right there, Peter Lubbers, and I'd be like, hey, Google Chrome's got this great emulate, uh, you know, essentially overrides functionality to it, right? And uh, yeah, it pretty much emulates most devices in such a way, right? Um, now, could you speak uh, maybe, Peter, a little bit more how it's actually doing that? Is it just changing user agent? That, that is an option at this point, but. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, but essentially, uh, there are some other tools that can help you. I, I totally understand the context problem. And my solution right now is to initially sandbox each component. And what we can do is 
essentially your media queries will work, but if you have JavaScript in there that's going to try to detect um, other things and do feature detection that will change the way the component's going to work or look, um, that's not going to be implemented unless you do, do something that's uh, essentially emulating that experience. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's only so far we could probably go with uh, showing you all the different contexts of that uh, component like um, in your documentation without, yeah. Does that sort of answer your question? No, no, yeah, like I'm, I'm interested to try to solve that. I think with some help from actual browsers um, when you're viewing, um, you know, if there was a Chrome experimental API that I could use to uh, turn on emulation of certain things, then that would be really cool. And maybe you guys could, you know, talk to some Googlers about it. Um, but that, that's essentially if there was integration with uh, the browser to help with that, then that, and that would be where you could potentially see uh, a really robust, uh, pe like, working, living uh, component that, uh, that you can, you know, f turn to, you know, iOS five and, and you see what it's going to look like and how it's going to react. So anybody else? The Questions? This guy up front, up here. Uh, yeah, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, so perfect uh, question. Um, that wasn't on sort of the future list. It's definitely like uh, in like pretty much a branch locally right now. Um, so it's, it's going to come there. And, and that is very useful. So that's a, a great question. As far as variables or anything that's uh, specific, even CSS variables are going to be like right around the corner um, natively. Um, you know, how, uh, that sort of comes along with some other things that I'm, I'm trying to address uh, with preprocessors, especially like extending from uh, certain classes. So um, I'm working on trying to solve that uh, as well as the inheritance issue. So imagine you have one, uh, you know, grid component that then, uh, it, or you have a nav bar component which gets, uh, uh, it's inserted into like a grid component. Um, it's going to potentially inherit some styles. And the only way to really address that is to almost do um, kind of like a source maps and then compile your CSS uh, from the preprocessor, get the compute styles to figure out <laughs> what was actually inherited from the browser and then and do some cool stuff. So there's some cool stuff I'm looking at to try to address that, uh, spinning up uh, headless browsers and things like that to, to do that. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as anything that's specific to preprocessors, uh, like variables, mixins, um, that's all going to be hopefully addressed at some point um, and provided to you in that JSON object. So again, it's very flexible. Uh, eventually, you'll just have potentially uh, something that's just like variables, and it's going to show you everything for that specific component or that, that component like, is using, right? So you can have reference to those. You can think on bringing a design to a board. Sure. Um, I was actually going to include, I had about 140 or 50 slides. Um, and then I got them down to 103. Um, so I had a number of slides where I talked about stuff like that. Um, there's been this ongoing, like I, I could probably like actually reinsert them, they're just like commented out. Um, but there's been obviously this big hubbub of, are this, I hate this, this phrase, designers should learn to develop, right? No, I, I hate that, right? Why don't developers learn to design, man? Like, no, I think that it's sort of looking at it from one angle. Um, I, I think that everything is designed, essentially. Design is a really bad word to talk about who it is. You know, developers archetype, or they design systems and frameworks and, and all these things. They design this stuff. Uh, business models are designed. Um, so, uh, so the communication, I think, will only come when uh, everybody starts to understand each other's jobs better. So I learn a little bit of code, you learn a little bit about design and why it's important to me. And that's, that's why I think, and I talked about it initially, about the way that I'm able to uh, plunk myself down in a position and talk 
to a team, I'm able to understand the goals and objectives of everybody uh, that much better. And so that's why I can get on board on, on new ideas and understand the reasoning behind uh, people's decisions. Um, and then you get this shared responsibility. So a designer, if they have a little bit more understanding of code and you have a little bit more understanding of design, you're going to work a lot better together, be a little bit more flexible, and then you're going to work together to uh, meet a certain objectives. So if one of those objectives is to have documentation, which is going to help uh, you know, the rest of your team implement a consistent you know, uh, UI across the board, then I feel like that's, and if that's a business objective, then you understand the reason why you're doing the work you're doing and why it's important to do it and why it's important to you know, document you know, your CSS. If your designers aren't coding um, and you're essentially getting a handoff, then there's that gap that I was talking about, and that's going to be a lot harder for you to, because uh, you know the responsibility is then just on one person to, to come up with this stuff. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Big round of applause. Oh, thanks. Thank